Our guest tonight, Dahlia Lithwick, knows her voice and she knows how to use it. She is a senior editor at Slate. She is the host of the podcast Amicus, and she regularly appears on all kinds of national television programs, most recently Trevor Noah's show, to explain what the heck is going on with the United States Supreme Court. So, Dahlia Lithwick is also a mom. She's a friend. Hi, Dahlia. Hi, Katie. I'm so glad to have you here. And you know, what I love about this is that tonight we are doing what women do. Like, come on over, have a glass of wine, and let's make sense of what's going on in the world. So thank you for being my friend and doing that with all of us here tonight. Thank you, Katie. You know, I've been wondering when to wear my RBG descent collar earrings, and it never, like I was never in a sort of media venue that was quite right, but like, there they are. Just there they are. Me. So Beautiful. thank you for having me. We're so glad you're here. So how are you holding up in the midst of all of this, covering, you know, perhaps one of the most, or the most unusual Supreme Court confirmation process we've ever seen in the midst of the most consequential presidential election we've of our lives. Um, you know, raising teenagers. How's how's the stress? How are you dealing with it? How you doing, woman? <laughs> yes. Um you I'm see, okay. you guys, she is our people. I'm I'm okay, Katie. I you know, I, I have to say I was just completely flatten when Justice Ginsburg died. I, I, it is ridiculous to say that the death of an 87 year old woman who was on her fifth bout of cancer surprised me, but it totally flattened me. And I also, I think was a little frustrated that like within five seconds of her death, instead of talking about her and remembering her, we were like strapping on the gloves and going, you know, 10 rounds on what's happening next. And so that's been hard because I really, I think needed like two, three days to sit with it and grieve and think about it and remember her and honor her. And I feel like kind of getting shoved into the Thunderdome to pull hair and kick is not so much where I wanted to be right now. 100%, so many women felt that way, feel that way. Um, and it is hard to move into the ring if you haven't had that time to reflect and recharge. We all know that from living our lives. Okay, so before we go into the ring on all the Supreme Court madness, can we just do that, Dahlia? I mean, you really knew RBG. You had one of the last interviews. I, I haven't gotten the details on this yet, so I'm just really excited to get it here. I mean, you were sharing with me that she, she really made you a better mom. And I know, you know, those of us who are familiar with her amazing lifetime of achievement, that's true on a policy scale, but you had this, you know, personal connection with her. And I just think people would love to hear about that. Yeah, it, I mean, it's it's crazy. I've told her, I think, two, three years ago that she helped raise my children and she kind of <laughs> looked taken aback. But, you know, I started covering the Supreme Court 20 years ago. My kids are 17 and 15. There was never a moment where she wasn't, you know, I wasn't in the chamber watching her, reading her, um, thinking about what she did. And I, the story I told her when I said, you help raise my children was that my son who's 17 now, but was probably, I guess, three or four at preschool. And he would sort of ritually bite a child in his class whenever I went to DC for the day. We lived in Charlottesville, Virginia. I would go for the day, I would come back. I, you know, it didn't seem a, a, an unfair thing, but he would just like chomp on somebody just to sort of log a little protest. And he started telling the preschool teacher, my mom is on vacation in Washington for 400 days. And then he would chomp someone. And the school sort of called me and said, like, he seems to be eating other children and can you <laughs> give us your entire schedule of every single day you're going to be away. And, you know, what do we do about this? And I remembered the story that Justice Ginsburg always told. I love this story about when she was, you know, a young mom, her son James was like quite naughty, I think she would say, and he would act out at school. She was running the ACLU Women's Rights Project. You know, her husband was a full-time tax lawyer and they only called her and everything was her fault. Of course, and yeah. He was right and it was like the 70s, so that makes some sense, but anyway, she would tell the story, Katie, she would go, the child has a father and I expect you to alternate 
calls between like it is not on me like it is not my fault because i'm the mom and that really helped me when i felt that every single thing that was going on with my kids was because my bad mommying as opposed to my husband's parenting and it's really ridiculous but i do think like put aside how smoking hot hot Army Hammer was playing, you know, Marty Ginsburg in the movie, which is ridiculous. But I really think like that movie captured how equal that marriage was and how mm -hmm. they both worked so hard to be partners. And that's just been a thing. Like I have like kind wow. of guided the ship by that. And she felt, I think she told me several times in interviews that like women need to fight for that kind of marriage. It's not going to get handed to you. Wow. I mean, the idea that so many years ago, that would be how she'd handle the call from the school, you know? I mean, I don't think I would have thought to say that, you know? I mean, it's the doctor's appointments, the school stuff, you know? And I think that it's just, once again, I here she is still reminding us of the power we have, you know? And they never called again. Like, they never <laughs> called again. That's, I forgot the most important part of the story. They're like, we have to call the dad. He's really busy. And suddenly everything was okay. But it's Oh, right. Right. Oh. There <laughs> what what a superpower right there. Um that's so cool. And wow, to have her that presence basically the entire time you have been raising your kids and to help guide you. I mean, all right, I'm gonna be calling you for parenting advice now, like on the regular, what would I know? Because it's okay, Dahlia, you just have to tell, channel RBG. I'm just going <laughs> to say, what would RBG do in this moment? Um, all right. So can I ask you also just what do your teenagers think about what you do and how do you even talk to them about the court or do you, I mean, yeah. a lot of, a lot of women in our, in our network have kids exactly your age, you know, teens. They're both boys. They're 15 and 17. Um, I think they've never known a time that I didn't do this. Like I didn't yeah. come to this job. So they were born to this. I think, uh, you know, they've both visited the court. They've both like, you know, there's a basketball. Here's a thing people don't know. There's a basketball court on the very top floor of the U.S. Supreme Court. It's known as the highest court in the land. <laughs> so like, okay. they I have see what both, you did there. Yeah. Yep, I like it. <laughs> We, we think that's hilarious in like <laughs> dork land that cracks us up. But um, so they've both been there. Um, you know, my younger son met Elena Kagan, I think two years ago I interviewed her and he knew she was a super like comic book wonk. And so like immediately pinned her with the essential question, like Superman versus Bas Batman, like must know. And she gave the right answer, which is Batman. But um, so they've, I think always grown up knowing that like, you know, mommy goes on vacation to Washington for 400 days, but I think they know that, um, you know, this is my job. And, and I think that they feel that in some sense, they've always thought that, you know, I'm so lucky. I'm one of a tiny handful of reporters who gets to be in the room. Yeah. Um, I will tell you one story, Katie, which is during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, when I was in fact sitting in the Senate chamber, when Christine Blasey Ford testified and then later when Brett Kavanaugh testified, my older son texted me, I guess he was in 10th grade, 9th grade, texted me from his school in Manhattan. I was in D.C. and said, are you perfectly safe in there? I'm nervous because he's shouting. And I thought, we forget how our lives, it would never occur to me that my kid thought I wasn't safe. And of course, I was perfectly safe. And of course, Judge Kavanaugh was just shouting, but that they feel things that we don't know they feel about our jobs and to have to write him back and be like, I'm fine. It's fine. He's just shouting. He's mad. Like I'm okay. But I think that um, they feel sometimes vulnerable to it in ways that I don't think about. Sounds like you're raising a good boy there. Empathy, little vulnerability. I love hearing that. What a sweet guy. Um, and it also is a reminder to me of, what is happening in the public sphere, what is on television, you know, teenagers and younger than that, they're taking it all in. Yeah. And I think that's part of what in this era is stressing us out as moms. You know, it's just like, we don't, we don't want that in their lives and it's not something we can control completely, but there are things we can do. And I want to get into this <laughs> with, um, uh, 
where where we are now. Um, Trump has made his nominee for the Supreme Court in Amy Coney Barrett, um, as you mentioned before RBG could even be buried. And I just think it's important to get right at it. You know, if if Trump does get this another his third nominee through, what are the most immediate consequences? Well, probably the one that folks are hearing, because I think it's just factually true, is that the court is going to hear a challenge to the Affordable Care Act immediately after the election. By the way, the court sets its docket. The court has chosen to you know, do that in November. It could have heard it in October. Frankly, it could have. It was meant to hear it last term. But the court has very carefully pushed that case till after the election. Mm-hmm. And if, in fact, the court sides with Texas and the states that are trying to do away with the ACA, quite literally 20 million some people will lose their health insurance, pre-existing conditions, you know, all of the benefits, particularly in a pandemic uh, of the Affordable Care Act, fall away. And that's just Can I say for sure she's going to strike it down? No, but she's written incredibly critically about the two earlier uh, challenges to the Affordable Care Act, and she's written critically of John Roberts, who sided with the left wing of the court in that. But I just think if you pan back a little more, and I want to be really clear, she seems lovely. And the people that I know who know her from Notre Dame and who know her from the appeals court say she's perfectly lovely. And of course, Merrick Garland was also very lovely. So I don't think that's sort of the marker of, of too much. I think the marker is that pretty consistently in her three years on the federal appeals court, she's been on the side of deregulating, you know, the agencies, deregulating government. She's been very, very much on the side of, um, you know, big business against workers. She's been on the side of prison guards who shot into a crowd of prisoners. I mean, it's just a record that looks a lot closer to Clarence Thomas's um, and Sam Alito's than to, I mean, not just, just Ruth Bader Ginsburg's, but even John Roberts. I mean, she's just fairly consistently been extremely conservative on things that really matter, like the environment and like on gun control and environmental protections and reproductive rights. So I think it's just fair to say that going from a court that was 5-4 with John Roberts in the middle to a court that is 6-3 with probably Neil Gorsuch in the middle or maybe Brett Kavanaugh in the middle, that's, you know, going to be the court for possibly a decade, possibly longer, and that's going to ripple through every single part of everyone's lived lives, even if we don't feel it right now. Dahlia, is this good for one single body of nine people who each serve for usually, you know, decades? Is this good (laughs) for so much power to rest in, in so few hands? Is this how it was supposed to be? Look, it's definitely not how it's supposed to be. And the framers really were very clear, you know, that the court was the quote unquote weakest branch, right? It was supposed to be the one that has neither the power of the purse nor the sword. That's from the Federalist Papers. The court was not supposed to be, you know, with the stroke of a pen, like taking away massive rights and freedoms from, you know, rape victims in schools or, you know, women seeking reproductive rights. So that's clearly not what was intended. I think it's, I've really been struggling with this, Katie, because, you know, I was the person who was like dancing on the rooftops when the court, you know, uh, uh, allowed us to have same-sex marriage for the first time in Obergefell. I was the person who was so happy and relieved this year when the court said the dreamers cannot all be deported, right? They're, they're here and they're here to stay. I was so happy this year when the court yeah. said Title VII protects LGBTQ workers. So I can't knock the court and then say, uh, you know, the court is totally. good. This is what I would say. I think that the views of the American public, if you look at the ACA, if you look at you know, fear about the environment, if you look at reproductive rights, if you look at worker rights, if you look at any number of rights, the American public is not aligned with this like very, very, very draconian view of the world and the government. Not on a single one of those issues. None. So even on Roe, you know, that no. sometimes the politicians would have us believe is some, you know, 50-50, but, you know, Roe v. Wade, people who identify as pro-life and pro-choice actually in majorities, I, I believe, agree, you know, with keeping 
Roe in place. And so to be in this situation where his nominee, is, it, it seems almost in, inevitable based on her record, how exactly she would rule. So yeah, that's where it seems like we're in a, a different spot where it's like, there's not even, okay, what's going to happen? These, these studied people to make a decision now and, and we don't know. Um, it's too <laughs> certain to go one way that's out of step with the people. So it, it, it's out of step, Katie. And there's one other piece of it that I think is important. It, it's good to remember that for most of the 200 some year history of the Supreme Court, it has been this completely, you know, white supremacist, patriarchal, like we shouldn't have fantasies about how great the court is, right? For right. most of history, the court was for business and it was for, you know, white men and like, let's call it what it is. So there's this mm -hmm. brief chunk of time in the 1960s and the 70s, 50s, 60s and 70s where the court does a lot of good, right? They do Brown v. Board and yeah. schools are suddenly desegregated and they do, you know, all the, the, for the first time we have one person, one vote and that matters, right? It really affects how we vote. and you know, Griswold, which gives us the right to access contraception for the first time. So the court does a bunch of really good things. And what the court is doing in those moments, I think is what the court was built to do, which is protect vulnerable minorities. So even when the legislatures and the executive branch are getting it wrong, the court, and that's Obergefell, right? That's marriage equality. Like we don't care if your state says it's a sin. We think that you should marry who you love. So when the court is protecting vulnerable minorities, I think it's kind of doing the thing. It's supposed to be a check on the majority. I think where we're going off the rails now is we've got a court that's a check on the majority, but it's being massively funded by dark money. We have no idea where all these millions of dollars that are going being poured into the court but also it's not protecting vulnerable minorities. It's protecting right. big business polluters and people who want to deregulate. You know. And how messed up is it that the court then has the power to protect that system so yeah. that it all stays because we're, yeah. we can't get our money out of politics. With we continue to have this system that Citizens United has allowed. I got to ask, you know, something that the women in our groups are talking a lot about too is it has to do with the timing of this nomination process vis-a-vis -vis the election and what that means for the election. So, you know, how likely do you think it is that um, she is confirmed and confirmed before the election? And what are the consequences for that if she is for the election itself? And of course, we have a, a president who is saying things like, you know, well, maybe I'll just stay. So what's the connection there? That, that's the part that gives me, as my son Kobe used to say, the hiki tikis. Like when I get nervous, yeah. it's that the president keeps announcing, we need nine justices because I need somebody to put the thumb on the scale for me. When I try to reject all the mail and of not protecting the most vulnerable. I mean, right. Again, but also, it doesn't help her at all. And it also doesn't help the legitimacy of the court. Remember when I said the court by design has no army, it has no budget. If Congress wanted to like, you know, turn off the plumbing and have no working toilets in the court and shut the lights, Congress could do that. The court has no power. It's literally only power is public esteem and regard. So when Donald Trump is lashing himself to the nominee in speech after speech and saying, we need to have her because we can't have eight because I need somebody to decide the election case when I try to throw out all the mail-in ballots, whether or not she decides with him or not is immaterial. He's now made her look awful. And moreover, he's made the court look awful. And so it's been bad enough that he's damaging her reputation, her dignity, her integrity, but he's really hurting the court. And just on the practical question, I mean, there are more than 200 lawsuits in 45 states and Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia all over the country, either challenging COVID procedures that are trying to make it easier for people to vote, or, you know, this administration saying, you know, we don't want you, you're going to have to have, you know, a witness, and you're going to have to have another witness and a notary, and all that's going to happen in COVID, and you can't have a drop box. So these lawsuits are going on everywhere. And we have no way of knowing right now, like four weeks out, whether it's going to be the privacy sleeves in Pennsylvania or if it's going to be the mail-in ballots in Nevada, any one of these could turn into Bush v. Gore. And any one of those could come up through a state Supreme Court or a federal district court. We don't even know that. 
to the U.S. Supreme Court. And it would be really good for the country if we believed that the Supreme Court was going to be fair. Right. And when Donald Trump says over and over and over again, like, no, I don't want it to be fair. I just want it to vote for me. Yeah. That's it's bad for the country. It's bad for the court. It's bad for Judge Barrett. And I don't know how to fix it because, again, I want people to believe that the courts can be fair. But yeah. boy, he is doing really, really good spade work to completely make us think the court's in the tank for him. I mean, this is why it's so important for the election results to be resounding, right? I mean, and I, I just got to say, sitting here in Ohio, working really hard to, to, to flip this state, this is why it's so important. And Ohio is now officially a toss up by every forecaster. If we can win here, a state that starts tabulating its mail-in ballots, you know, as they come in um, and that, you know, has a Republican governor and secretary of state. So likely to be less of a challenge there between them and the president. Ohio, make it happen. <laughs> so that some of these other things maybe don't matter quite as much. Just saying that's one thing we can do right here at home. Um, okay. I, I gotta ask you though, Dahlia, I mean, she is a lady. <laughs> what? I mean, you got, you got a girl. Um, what do you say when you get that? Um, I, I will tell you, I don't lose my temper very often. Like I am mm -hmm. fundamentally in this sense, just the most level person in the world. But when I started seeing the t-shirt with the crown on her head and the notorious ACB, like insignia, like within seconds of the rollout in the White House, I got about as crazy as I get and wrote something a little intemperate that I probably shouldn't have published, but I was really shocked. Not just we forgive you. Pardon me. Well, we forgive you. I, I have a rule, Katie, which is never write angry. And it's funny because Justice Ginsburg always said her mother told her always be a lady. Do not get controlled by strong emotions. And I've yeah. tried not channeling RBG, but just trying to be sort of I cover the law. I'm not a politician. I don't cover the White House. Just be flatline. But Seeing them kind of conscript Justice Ginsburg's entire legacy as a feminist and then like try to roll this person out as notorious ACB when we know, I mean, we have three years of judicial writings. We have years of academic writing. We know this is the person who is going to dismantle the sort of equal protection rationale that Justice Ginsburg built with her own hands, both as an advocate for years and yes. then justice. And so it feels like it would be like saying like, hey, Clarence Thomas, he's the same as Thurgood Marshall, right? And oh, right. argument at the time. And I guess at some level, if you've got this essentialist notion that the success of any woman <laughs> means that like we've all broken through and we're all equal and the world is fair for women and that like 30 cent pay gap doesn't happen anymore. I guess under that metric, it's okay that she's- It sounds a great and very imaginary. <laughs> it's just not the world I live in. And if your view of feminism is that the person who's going to dismantle, you know, the 60 year legacy of Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a woman, and that means it's a triumph for feminism, then like, oh my God, that's a real yeah. narrow view of women. No kidding, no kidding. Okay, Dahlia, I actually wanna to get to what I think is the most important part of this conversation. And that is, I mean, honestly, the court can just feel like this intangible thing up in the sky, you know, up on the hill that we have no say over. Um, but I know that you have a different take on that. You know, what is the influence that we can have? You are talking to suburban women across America right now. You know, what is the influence over what is happening right now and beyond um, that we can have that can that can make a difference, not just make us feel better? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, again, by design, right? Article three judges, lifetime tenure. You're not, you're not impeaching any of them. And I think you were right when you said Judge Barrett is a sure thing. I don't think we're going to stop her uh, from being confirmed. So what can you do? You just feel like you're powerless. And let's be super clear, we haven't said it, but Donald Trump has also seated 200 federal judges on the lower district courts. And the mm -hmm. like. this is unrecognizable. No president has seated more judges in modern history. And they are going to decide like 99.999% of the cases that don't get to the Supreme Court. So that's a lot. 
And it is really easy to feel disempowered with yes. a government that you can't recall, and you can't write strong letters to, and you can't vote in four years. But this is what I say, and I think I've been saying this particularly to women in the since the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, where I think a lot of women were pretty bruised and didn't know where to put yes. what had happened. And I started saying, and this is just descriptively true, and I think it's useful. Every single case that was on the docket this term, so right, the term that just ended, we had abortion, we had contraception, we had guns, we had the, um, uh, uh, DACA, we had Title VII. This was the biggest term of my career. Every one of those cases was on the docket for the year before. The court mm -hmm. didn't hear any of them. They pushed them all into the 2019 term. Well, why? because Brett Kavanaugh, because public opinion was so roiled, people were angry, they were worked up, women were wow. so jacked up and angry that they just pushed every single case that they could have heard two years ago to this spring. And what that tells me is that the court is actually very sensitive to mm -hmm. our public opinion, to our ideas, to our anger, to what our threshold is of how much we will put up with. And so what I always say, and it sounds so cheesy, but I'll say it, it's the rule when you go camping at Yellowstone and they say, if you see a bear, try to look bigger than you are. And you're like, but I'm not bigger than I am. But like, actually it works. Like be loud, call your Senator, like just make it plain to the court that that does not reflect your view and all the thousands of ways you can do it. The court, changes. John Roberts' vote this year, I think very, very much was moderated by the fact that he felt that public was watching him. And I'm not saying terrorize them, but just be mindful that they care. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, early you, earlier you said, I mean, their power actually rests in terms of that public esteem. And it, they, so they are sensitive to when that esteem is lessened, yes. it sounds like, in very substantive, measurable ways. I just hope women really heard that out there because I think that there's so many of us who were just gutted by everything around Kavanaugh and it felt like, you know, in the end he still got on and you have named direct outcomes of the fight that so many women participated in and put their hearts into that it was not for naught. And so I think that we have to keep that in mind here now and always. That's such a, thank you for making that so clear. Dahlia, okay, I only have you for a couple more minutes and I love to do just this rapid fire and piece here. Um, all right. Are you ready? Take a big step. Okay. A piece of advice you would give your teenage self. Don't care what anybody thinks of you. Don't, don't be, don't try to make yourself, I just did the, don't be bigger, be bigger than you are. Don't try to be smaller than you are. Say that again. Just don't be smaller than you are. Don't think that you're too loud or your hair is too big or you're too much of a debater. Like, it's all dumb. You're great. I think I would have just said to myself, all the energy you are spending trying to be like mayonnaise with vanilla with mayonnaise on top, like just to not terrorize anyone. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. Your favorite guilty pleasure. Oh my God, that Netflix show about cleaning out your closets, the new, like the one with the people. I haven't watched it yet. I've oh heard God. it has addictive like qualities. Porn, Katie. It's like, and they come in and there's bins and they're labeling. And I'm just like, can you do that inside my brain to like vote fraud? Yeah, no, that's, oh, oh, oh. Okay, I'm going to watch it tonight to help myself <laughs> like go to sleep and just, you know, when you got to turn it all off. Um, the one person you'd most like to get a glass of wine with dead or alive you know i think right at this second justice ginsburg's granddaughter who really i think is grieving is struggling who you know president trump the minute he heard that justice ginsburg said i think we should wait to the election and he passed that through she passed that through her granddaughter and trump immediately said she's a liar and it was a hoax and i just right. think this is you know chasing people out of the public square for being truthful I think uh, wine and a hug, Katie, <laughs> maybe in the other order. I love that. Okay. I'm going to end on this one. What gives you hope? 
So, you know, I, I've been pretty rattled by the vote fraud stuff and the claim mm -hmm. that every single mail-in ballot is fraudulent and that poll watchers are going to go to the poll. Like, if you follow elections law, this week has been a pretty scary week. Yeah. And I told you this in the green room, but I'll say it again. I talked to a woman today, Carol Anderson, who teaches history at Emory, African-American history. And, you know, I was kind of like, well, it's terrible. This guy's falling, he's throwing out the ballots. He says they're in creeks. If there's no ballots in creeks. And she <laughs> just said, honey, <laughs> if you're African-American in this country, voting has been like this since reconstruction. And you, I mean, I know, it's hard and scary and that having, you know, Bill Barr threatening to get involved is really intimidating. And she just reminded me that, you know, for a very long time in this country, if you were black or you were poor or you were a woman, <laughs> you didn't matter. And yet still you changed everything. And if it meant standing in line for six hours with a battery pack and your fanny pack and like a little granola bar and some what like you did it and so I just think it's kind of the thing Joe Biden said at the end of the debate which is like this is not Donald Trump's world we are yeah. just kind of renting space here but like it's on us and yeah. I think talking to people like Carol Anderson to Anita Hill to Justice Ginsburg who just their whole lives doors were slammed in their faces and they, mm -hmm. they were just like no yeah it gives me hope Dahlia, thank you for taking all of that energy in from those women and sharing a little bit of that with us tonight. Thank you. All right. I want to invite Julie, Red, Wine, and Blues organizing director. Hey, Hi. Julie. <laughs> and um, I think you have, oh, Heather. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> what are you doing? And hey, Susan. Um, anyway, we have a few women who are just going to reflect on the conversation and all the wisdom you've shared with us tonight, Dahlia. Thank you, Dahlia. I have on my descent earrings too. You probably can't see. <laughs> you said, and I was literally just put mine on. I was like, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. All right. Thanks, ladies, for being here, and Dahlia. Thanks for um, the knowledge and the inspiration. Oh, thank you. Thank you all. Okay, so welcome, ladies. Before we start, I have to um, show you that I actually have my RBG shirt on that I just got. Okay. I haven't worn oh, yeah. it. Perfect opportunity to match the descent earrings. So, um, I'm gonna. St we we seem to have lost. Um, well, we first have one more, but must have maybe lost her. She's not here. But um, you guys go ahead and introduce yourself. Heather, why don't you just say your name, where you live, a little bit about you. Sure. My name's Heather Canner, and I live in Mason, Ohio. I'm a neighbor of yours, Julie, not too far away. And I am a full-time working mom of two young kids. I have a pre k and a first grader, and my husband is actually doing COVID testing. I'll plug him a little bit. So he's been super busy, um, and you can imagine how crazy things have been with COVID. Yeah, I imagine. So, yeah. And you guys have probably met Susan before, but introduce yourself again, Susan. Hi, I'm Susan from Cleveland. I'm a regional organizer with Red Wine and Blue, and I'm super bummed that I don't have my descent necklace on um, that my stepdaughter got me. And I also have an enamel pin, and it says "Flaming Feminist" on it. And that <laughs> is also something that RGB said when she was in an interview years ago. Someone they were tr kind of pussyfooting around with this question, like. They wanted to ask her, how did you get involved in feminism? And she just shut down the person asking the question. She's like, are you asking me when I became a flaming feminist? So, which I love. So I have this really colorful enamel pin that maybe I'll wear next time. But it's a treasured possession of mine. <laughs> I would like to see that. That sounds amazing. <laughs> so I don't know what you guys thought about the whole discussion we just heard. I personally was... She was, that was the first time I've ever heard somebody make me feel a little bit hopeful about what's going on with the Supreme Court. Yeah, I don't yes. know what your guys' takeaways were from that. I don't know, Heather, what, what resonated with you? Um, she definitely made me feel more hopeful um, just in regards to, I didn't realize how, I hadn't been following it as closely, how many cases got pushed off just to yeah. kind of calm, calm the fire because people were just so, um, you know, 
emotional and, you know, on both sides. So, but my dad's always been telling me too, he has so much great esteem for John Roberts and a lot of what he's been saying about how he doesn't think, you know, Justice Roberts will, he thinks he's going to try to keep the peace. I've always been skeptical of it, but it's kind of played out in some of his rulings. Yeah, I, I kind of agree. I don't know how many people are familiar with the court history, but Chief Justice Warren, Warren Court, which was one of the most progressive courts or, you know, Ro um, not Roe versus Wade, but um, well, maybe it was. I'm, I'm showing my my forgetfulness, but it was one of the most progressive courts. And he was appointed by, I believe, Eisenhower, and, and that, which upset Eisenhower because he became one of them. He, they thought he was going to be conservative and he became more liberal. So I do think there are justices that over time on the court, their life changes, their public opinion sways them. You know, this is a permanent job, which can be good or bad. So um, that gave me, it gives me a little hope to see some movement. Um, I'm still concerned that we're still looking at pretty much a 63 conservative court, but mm -hmm. I, I was glad to hear that this public pressure can actually have a toll and make a difference on these justices. Susan, what about you? What did you think about that conversation? Yeah, you know, um, I too was flattened. And when she described that, I'm like, oh my God, that's exactly how I felt. And it's sad that, uh, hey, you. Hey, Meredith. <laughs> Can she hear us yet? I don't know. Can you hear us, Meredith? Wave if you can hear us. Oh, I can't hear. Oh, no. She <laughs> We're having a lot of technical difficulties here. But, all right. Um, um, go ahead, Susan. Sorry. But, you know, it's it, it, it was, I'm still very upset about it. And what makes me, angers me even more is that, like, the small, old shoulders of a little 87-year-old woman I feel that was the last thing protecting us between, you know, a throwback to, I love referencing Handmaid's Tale, but it's kind of reminds me of that a little, um, that she was the, the, the backstop for environmental protection and workers' rights and our reproductive freedoms and equal pay. And now that that is gone, I'm, I'm you know, sick about it and scared and worried. But when she said, um, the court is sensitive, I thought that was really, that gave me some hope and that, um, be loud because you can change everything, which I have no trouble being loud, but, but for her, you know, that just gave me a sliver, more than a sliver, but that we can make a difference and our voices do matter and just keeping the pressure on because this seems to be an inevitable thing that's going to happen, which, right. Makes and I totally agree. agree. I love the, yes, what you, exactly what you just said, use our voices and keep the pressure on. And obviously one of the things we all need to be doing right now is keeping the pressure on because we are rapidly approaching November. Um, and I think we need to honor RBG and all she did for women by continuing that legacy. And we have to, we have to be, what did she say? Be, be bigger. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. there, right? We have to be that force. And so that is all what we're about is trying to use your voices and take action. And so what Red Wine and Blue does is we have a community of women who are doing this by using the Outvote app, which is listed here on the screen. You can download it, you can enter our campaign code, you can join with us. We have Collective Power Lady, we can make a lot of noise and we need to do it and we need to do it from now yes. until November 3rd. What are you guys feeling right now? I know that we've had a lot. We had you know, the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we've had this beginning of the Supreme Court nomination battle, um, the whole notorious ACB thing just really set me off too that Dahlia was talking about. Um, and then we had the debate. <laughs> or what, 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 Heather, what was your takeaway? How are you feeling about all this right now? I mean, I had heart palpitations for an hour after that debate, but I also think I am really hopeful. Um, I was even telling you earlier, I've now had a few neighbors reach out to me wanting to get involved because of it. So the reason I'm not so in despair, like I hear from people who are just so upset and so, um, you know, unhopeful, but because we as a, you know, a group here take so much action, I don't actually, I, I actually feel really hopeful because of that, because I know there's so many of us doing something and there's so much in just the power of actually doing something is right. really, you know, it's, it's big. And it's, so it's just, I'm more motivated now to get more people involved and, um, I'm committed. <laughs> we have so little time left. 
hundred percent. I always say, I don't want to feel like I did after nope. 2016 when I woke up and feeling like I should have done more. And you honestly, I feel thing. like the solution to that feeling of helplessness and the feeling that Dahlia was discussing how so many people feel like, well, I can't do anything about that. Well, yes, you can. You mm -hmm. can take action. You can use your voice. You can make a difference. And so I a hundred percent think no matter what, it's going to make you feel better. It is a little, it is self care. You know, we all need a break sometimes, but it doing something makes you feel better. Um, Susan, what about you? What, what are you feeling right now? I know there's been a whole lot going on. Um, you know, again, I, I keep thinking of reliving that morning of horror when I woke up in 2016 and realized that it was my nightmare had come through. Um, and I never want to feel like that again. And I am doing every, I'm spending every waking moment to make sure I don't feel that way again. And I don't want to leave the, you know, I don't want this world, this, universe that we're in to continue on this track. Cause I think it's really, it's not who we are as Americans. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we um, unite and use our voice, um, I'll give you an example, just after the debate, well, during the debate, my phone was ping, 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 texting, you know, everybody was like flipped out all my lady friends. And then afterwards, the next day, it seemed to be, uh, you know, they wanted to know about Outvote. How, how, can you tell me about that app again? How do I do it? How do I, you know, how, what are you doing this weekend? Are you canvassing? Are you doing door uh, lit drops? What are you doing? So I think that really, it's almost like that was, we keep saying there's all this, the final straw, but I think that was one of the final straws. Yeah. You know, like if you were watching that debate and you weren't disgusted and worried about our elections and the security and safety of our elections, then I think you're half dead anyway, but you have to be moved to action to, to stop this madness. Right. Mm -hmm. Heather, what were your neighbors saying to you? The ones who co contacted you, first of all, it's amazing that they need to contact you. So like you have been speaking out and doing stuff since 2016. I think you may have even before, but um, I'm glad that they knew to reach out to you because you've been using your voice, but what what was the impetus? Was it just they couldn't believe what they saw at the debate? I mean, was that what was their reaction? I mean, it's just a final straw. They're just so sick of this. Um, one neighbor in particular even said, she's like, I just can't believe this is what our country has come to. Like, and I was like, oh, you know, and then I threw out, like, do you want to do some postcards? Like, no, I want more than that. So, you know, she wants to do calls, she wants to do texting. I think everyone's having a little bit of PTSD from the 2016 election. I right. never want to wake up like I did on my couch at 10, 11 PM, whenever it was called to see my husband drinking liquor yeah. and texts on my phone saying <laughs> President Trump and my heart racing. I never right. want to feel like that again. I've never done anything before. I never, every election since I've been extremely involved and vocal about it. So people know to come to me and then I try to give them tangible things to do. Okay. And I want to speak to all the ladies out there who, I mean, all of us have different levels of comfort. Um, mm -hmm. I had never really done almost anything before 2016. And you just take your baby steps and you just have to do what works for you. Yep. So don't feel like if you're not, you know, dropping lit and making phone calls, because some people don't want to do that. There are all different ways to be involved. There are all different things you can do and every action makes a difference. So that's why we really like, and we'd love for you to be involved with what we're doing because it is literally from your couch it is on your phone. It is talking to people that you know. Um, and I feel like that is a very easy entry point to doing this type of work. And I hope it leads you to do even more. Um, I found the ladies that I have worked with since 2016 who never had done anything either. I, you know, I, I mean, they're amazing. They are now, we have like a couple of women who've never done anything. They're probably in their sixties and they are like blowing off. Well, when you could can <laughs> We could knock doors. They were like knocking all these doors. And I mean, it was just amazing to see the transformation. Um, but again, you also feel very empowered when you take action. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, I really enjoyed hearing from Dahlia and I'm really glad that you guys could come on tonight. And I'm sorry, Meredith out there. We, we lost Meredith. She technical difficulties. We'll have Meredith back on because Meredith is amazing. Um, we want to thank you guys all for watching though. And we hope that you will consider downloading the app. We're going to leave it here for one more second. So you can write down the information or reach out to us through red, wine and blue. If you have questions and everybody enjoy the rest of their evening. Cheers, ladies. Cheers. <laughs> Bye.